Hey, Carlos. How are you? Good. How are you? Hey, how are you, eh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was four. Yeah. yeah. That's weird that you should not ever come around and. I I mean, it's it's so, uh, okay, let's talk about me. No, I say, all right. Okay. I'm not sure. 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 Oh, for a person. The pizzas are about to arrive, and if you want, there's a beverage over there. You can pour yourself a drink as for for us to to win. Don't be shy. I, I win. <laughs> <laughs> huh? It's coming um, from Chile. Chile. Oh. Gonna be around tomorrow. No, no, it's coming today. I mean, like, is this open to everybody or just um... open to everybody? Okay, You're the most welcome. Okay, cool. What's yeah. your name? I'm Katie. Katie. I think I'm in your property class. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you. Everybody, <laughs> hello. How are you? Good. Hello. 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 Okay, so there's my house. The one right there. Oh, the pepper. Yeah. Um, yes, please. Cool. Oh, no, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. It's noon, so we're going to start with this presentation about the topic business and human rights, fighting modern forms of slavery. Before entering into the presentation, I want to address a bit about the topic. Because for me, this topic was rather new about four years ago. And for some classmates that I've, I spoke about this, it's also brand new today. Because business and human rights doesn't sound like a good couple. The business is for a profit, and the human rights is for a non-profit. But we, this is a developing trend, and we'll see what it's about. And I hope, I, I hope that we all will leave this room in less than an hour, knowing a bit more about this subject. First of all, what is modern slavery? That's the first thing that is a bit shocking because when I spoke about this in Chile, for example, and I believe for most of you also, we tend to believe that slavery is over. You see, 19th century, in the, the world, the slavery was over, was abolished. Here in the US was a tragic event, the civil war that ended slavery. But the slavery remained in the world. The difference is that now slavery is hidden, it's clandestine. You don't see the, the old uh, way of slavery. That's why we're talking about modern slavery. You won't see, for example, the transatlantic shipment of people from Africa to America to brought here against their will as slaves. You will see, you are not seeing this today, but you are seeing around the world 
that around 50 million people are held against their will. And that's why we are talking about a modern form of slavery. Well, it's a global issue. And, and I said, the relation with business is that within business, everybody wants to have like a good company. Everybody wants to buy a nice product. And the estimation, the estimation, the estimations that all of us, all of us today, we have around like 50 or 60 a slave. Did you know that? That you all and I were owners of slaves? Because all our, most of our clothes, our computers, our telephones, everything that we own in the modern world, in some part of the chain of supply, was made by modern slavery, by forced laborers. And why they are forced laborers? What is the characteristic of a forced laborer? Well, first of all, when we talk about the forms of modern slavery, there are several forms, sex trafficking, child sex trafficking, but we are addressing today the modern forms of slavery related to business. And that is forced labor and child, child uh, forced labor. So what it could be a working definition of forced labor? It's work done under the threat of coercion of or punishment. It's not work done, uh, it's not work done with a little payment. Perhaps in, in some countries, you can say, oh, these people are working and they're paying so poor wages, it's some sort of slavery. But if they're free to go, if they're free to leave their, their, their jobs, it's not slavery. It's, a, it's only a, a badly paid job, but it's not slavery. What, is, what, uh, what made it a slave labor or modern slave labor is that those persons don't have the ability, the capacity to leave that place. That's why they are forced workers. Deprives individuals for the, for the, of the freedom to choose or leave employment. And the method of, of, of coercion, threats, uh, threats, violence, abuse of power. Typically, they are, typically the, 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 the typical scenario is that they are foreign workers and they're invited to work in a country and the employer promises them the world. And once they arrive to this new country, the, this employer holds, withholds their passports and, and tell, tell to them, you are no one here. You have to work for me or you're gonna be perhaps, what, what could happen to you? You could disappear here, nobody knows you. So you have to keep working for me. And that's, that's the definition of the image of a person subjected to forced labor. <laughs> For example, in another area that is not related with business, at least not with legal business, for example, the, the sex trafficking, they operate in the same way. They invite women from another country, they took into the, the country where the, 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 the gangs are operating, they would hold their passports and do the same thing. In business and human rights, the industries that employs more uh, forced labor Workforce are agriculture, construction, manufacturing, among others. And if you see here, it said these persons could be paid. It's not like the, the image of a slave in the 18th century, 19th century. They, this could be paid. They could get a pay. But what makes the notion of an individual subject to forced labor, even if it's getting paid? What is the main characteristic of an individual subject to forced labor? That he cannot leave the place. He has no will. He could be paid, usually very, very low, very low payment, but he cannot leave the place. That's the point of being uh, the difference between an underpaid worker and a forced laborer. In the world, it is estimated that forced labor or this type of modern slavery generates $150 billion a year. That's, his, that's for example, it's half, it's half of the Chile's GDP in one year. It's a lot of money. Here we have a map made by Global Slavery Index and the the redder the country, 
There's more slaves working. And the, the brightest of the country, if you have less. For example, North America, Chile, Argentina, Europe, there are countries that have little issues with, with modern slavery. But in the area of Asia and some countries in Africa, uh, slavery is a big issue until today. A question, have you ever met someone who owned a slave in, in person? Have you ever met someone? In, in Chile, uh, a bishop very committed with human rights told me that when, when he was appointed to Mauritania in the, in the 70s, he had to Mauritania, that's a three country, and the people in the, in the city gave him a welcome and said, here, you have five slaves for you. What would have you done? You say, I don't want this slave. I, I, I'm a mother person, I would, I would never have slaves. It's your problem. It's your pro you, do, you see what you do with these persons? It's for, they're for you, and I'm gonna leave. So this person obviously didn't treat them badly, treated them the best way he could, and immediately started the process to set them free. He didn't hold the slaves. But for a few days, I, I, I am, uh, and I'm talking about 50 years ago, you see, the, the, this issue, when you, when you see Mauritania in the third place, I know for, for, a, for a personal story that, that things, these sort of things happen. It's not like the mere, mere numbers or mere statistics. These things are really happening in, in today's world. The fight. We're in a fight. We know this, this is a problem. We all know now there is a problem with modern slavery. So how do we how could we address that problem? How could we fight? Because in any civilized country hates slavery. Slavery is even a sort of crime against humanity. The traffic of slaves, the prohibition of the traffic of slaves is part of the use cogens and international law. Every country is sort of obliged to fight slavery, but slavery is still going on. So at the, at the level of the Sustainable Development Goals, we have the goal 8.7 that addresses this issue. Take measures to eradicate forced labor and, and other situations that are related with the subject of today. Also, regarding business, have you ever heard about ESG investing? What is ESG investing? Yes. <laughs> what is? Well, corporations can undertake voluntarily measures such as, uh, you know, the ESG um, to mitigate harmful effects that their business has on uh, their immediate local communities or in general. And the Securities and Exchange Commission, and I'm interested primarily in finance. Exchange Commission um, made climate change disclosures uh, mandatory for corporations. I'm not sure if that law is at that point. But that's just an example. Thanks so much. That's the E. That's the E. That's the E. Right. This, are, this is like a seal. You, you want to invest in a company that is a nice company. You don't want to be related or connected with a company that do business with slave owners, do you? Nobody wants that. So this concept of ESG investing, E is environmental, thanks to Maria for explaining that. So S for social and D for governments. At the level of the United Nations, and for you to see this is a very trending topic, in June of this year, June 2024, there will be a meeting, you know, the, Human, Human Rights Commission of the United Nations to address the issue of investors, ESG, and human rights. There's a question, there was a panel on December 2023 in England about how do, do you convince the C-suite of a company that this issue is relevant? Paulo, could you explain what is a C-suite of a company? The C-suite of the company. The C suite, the CEO, the board of the company. 
the board of, how, how do you convince the board of a company that you they have to take these issues seriously? And the explanation, or they, they were saying, is that you don't want to be involved in an issue that suddenly there's a lawsuit, a big lawsuit against your company, and that a lawsuit is not for something like um, um, a contractual prevention. That issue is because your partners in somewhere in the world were, were using slave labor. The reputation of your company will suffer a lot for that. And you want to avoid that. And how do you can comply with these rules? Because these are not legal rules. These are not mandatory. These, these are not bound rules. But as a lot of things in the human rights world, it depends on the will of people or corporation to comply with these issues. And you can even have a, a sort of label that you are an SAG company. And that means for the consumer that are buying a product that perhaps perhaps it's a bit more expensive, but you have the, the awareness that you have some degree of certainty that no slave or no modern slave or forced labor was used in the creation of that product. That makes sense? For, for me, it, it does. Something happened with teams. <laughs> At the international, you can see the comparative laws that address this issue. We see, for example, in England, we have the UK Modern Slavery Act of 2015. In France, 2017. And regarding the business and human rights, these laws, for example, the section 54 of the UK Modern Slavery Act precisely address the topic of the chain of supply. Because as business, what a company the most they can do, one for, for uh, the first point, is not hire, not use forced labor in their immediacy. But when they are talking with foreign companies and the concept of the chain of supply, the most they can do is just ask and say to the partners around the world, hey, I don't want to use that you use any type of forced labor. How do you comply with that? You can set person to watch those, those operations and you can have this label. But no company is uh, free of not, uh, or no company in the world is free of never be related with a, a rural area that, that we're, we're using forced labor. So what can we expect from companies? That they did their most, they did their most, they did their, 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 their due diligence to try to avoid this issue. In the United States, have you ever, ever heard about Northern Marianas? The Pacific Island is a commonwealth of the United States. It's not a state. I'm from there. Huh? Uh, hey, Carlos, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm online, but yeah, I'm, I'm originally from the Northern Mariana Islands. Yeah, and you know, Sorry. do you know the case? You told me about the case. Yep, the one involving um, uh, Best Sunshine uh, and there's, uh, well, their parent company with Imperial yeah. Pacific, I think is what they're called, International. Um, I, I actually worked on um, uh, a civil litigation case uh, in the federal courts with a, an attorney with, I think, like seven clients involving uh, human rights abuses uh, and other issues related to the construction of the um, casino in the, yeah, the Pacific uh, casino. island. Yep. So there you see Northern Mariana Islands, the one. That's the, that's, the, that's the place. Thank you so much, Mark. So it's the Saipan Casino construction case. And there were workers, seven Chinese workers who sue this company. Its company is located in the United States. It's not the state of the United States, but it's part of the United States. It's a US district over there. And they saw, they, they, they sued this, this company, this construction company for casino, and they were rewarded for $5.2 million in compensatory damages for being subject to what now? <laughs> for, for being subject to modern slavery. Another law of the United States that, that is, and this law does not address the issue of slavery specifically, but it has been used, is the Alien Tort Statute. 
Have you ever, ever heard about that? It's part of the judicial code, the 28th title of the US code. And this law is very old. It's the section 1350 of the US code, title 28, the, the judicial code. This law is very old, it was enacted in 1789 and was uh, addressed at that time for crimes against nations. For example, piracy. This law allowed, uh, the, 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 the text of the law, the black letter also said, the district court shall have original jurisdiction of any civil actions by an alien for a tort only committed in viol violation of the law of nations or a treaty of the United States. That was in at the end of the 18th century. Nowadays, and since the, the last decades of the 20th century, this has been used to sue here in the US um, to bring lawsuits against, against companies that in some part of the chain of supply have used forced labor by the Alien Tort Institute. So it's a tool that is available here. It's a picture, uh, the section 1350, Aliens Actions for Tort. That's new, I guess. Have you ever heard of before about the Alien Tort Institute? It's very interesting. That's what they, they, they text there. Um, but this Supreme Court of the US, how do you think is feeling about the chance that any person who was affected, for example, to forced labor in a, a foreign country can bring a lawsuit here against a big, big company? What do you think the Supreme Court of the US will say these days with this composition? No thanks, right? There is the, the way, is the, the device, the Alien Tort Institute. But thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And that's what happened with the, the case of Nestlé against John Doe. That case was decided by the Supreme Court in 2021. This case were brought by residents, now residents in the US, who when, when whom one were child, were subjects to child forced labor in Ivory Coast, extracting cacao. And that cacao ended in Nestle chocolates that we all ate at some point of our lives. So we, as we get with the cacao we were eating. The legal action was filed like, under the Alien Tort Institute against Nestle and Cargill. Do you remember to talk about Cargill before? In a case, do you remember? You talked about Cardio. And the, the allegation was these companies, they knew that the suppliers of cacao were using child forced labor. So under that interpretation of the Alien Tort Institute, they were liable here in the US and the lawsuit was brought here in the US. And it's also some type of class action because the six persons were complaining not only for in their behalf, but also on behalf of all the other children that were subjected to child forced labor in Ivory Coast. But after an 11 year trial, finally the Supreme Court decided in an eight against one decision that they can't decide the case here in the US because they, they think the, the tort happened outside the US in Ivory Court, in Ivory Coast. And the connection, do you remember in, in procedure, procedure, the connection when you're talking about different jurisdictions, the connection was too weak with the US. So they ruled against this claim. There was no solution. So that's the Alien Tort Institute, the most recent case. The tool could be used to address forced labor, yes. Depends on the Supreme Court at the end, which way it's gonna go. Another law in the US that addresses this issue is the California Transparency in Supply Chains Act of 2012, sorry, of uh, 2012, yes. And this, uh, this law, this act is in the California Civil Code. 
but requires only that the companies that sell over $100 million in California, they, they are required to address how they are facing the threats, the threats of uh, forced labor, for example. It's, it's not, in a, they're not mandated to actually do, do something against forced labor, but they have to declare what are they doing to avoid being related with a forced labor partner that will sell the, the supplies to them. But also this law has been used in two cases. 2018, the case of uh, Beard versus Mars about uh, cat food. You know how important is cat food, right? It's a vital, you have to keep your cat happy. Mm -hmm. And those cat food, the, the, this, this type of cat food, the, the, the ingredient, the, the fish were, were fished in, in Thailand by people from Thailand that were subject to forced labor. But again, the courts decided that they will pass with the case. It's not good enough to disclaim. It's not has this, the, the connection is not too strong because what you can expect, what you, what you can demand from the company that it was selling the cat food in California was only to the, the uh, was only a declaration of what they are doing to, to, to address the issue, not exactly to avoid that in some part of the chain of supply, some fishermen in Thailand were uh, using us for forced workers, forced laborers. So was this lawsuit and was dismissed. And the next case is Barber versus Nestle in 2015, also in California, because it's, this is California law. And it's applied by Nestle again. Again. Nestle, oh, no. the battle of water. No, I don't know. No? That's not Nestle. <laughs> Nestle again. And um, in this case, they were allegating the same thing. But at the end, nothing happened. And the courts in this decision, Barber versus Nestle, they ruled within the scope of the safe harbor doctrine, saying that the company uh, must do compliance, but cannot be held liable, even in all the chain of supply, there were used some sort of forced labor. Well, that's all that I have prepared for today. I will be delighted if you want to ask some questions. And the pizza's over there, so feel free to eat. Thank you so much. Paulo. Carlos, uh, we have been our criminal court in Brazil uh, uh, that says conditions analogous or similar to slavery. Because we know that. Uh, the Hacienda Verde. Yeah, business businessmen, they kind of try to not follow the rule, so they try to bring conditions that looks like this. So judges, they have an important rule to fight against uh, this situation that looks like, as you told, uh, is labor, modern slavery in Brazil. And another issue important about our country is that uh, the Brazilian society, of course, there is a lot of problems going on, but they miscegenate a lot. Like so, uh, in the past, Brazil uh, ends up in slavery before the United States. Uh, that was like two centuries ago. So it's just a curiosity I would like to bring that uh, I think being uh, as founding fathers just said two more than two hundred years ago, uh, free is not uh, something about a country. It's something about humanity. And congrats to you for the team and hope. All the lawyers here, and we keep doing do this like fighting slavery and those type of things. So, thank you so much. Yes, in, in our countries, in our Latin American countries, Chile abolished slavery in 1823. And since 1118, all the sons of a slave woman were free. And any slave that set a foot in Chile was free. So, and, and during uh, until 1925, the Chilean rules. For example, forbids any slave trader trader to ask for the Chilean citizenship. 
or to be in Chile for more than more than a month. Because at that time we we knew that slavery was something that, that, was, that was going on. But nowadays slavery is clandestine. We, we don't see it. But it's, it's over there. And, and and 50 million people for me as a Chilean is a lot of people. Chile has only 20 million population Chile is only 20 million, it's like the state of New York. So imagine twice the people of the state of New York in the world being subjected to some sort of modern slavery. It's, it's a lot of, of, of people. Conan. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the very interesting uh, sharing. Uh, my question is more of a procedural one. I just wonder, because those kind of cases in litigation, they're kind of cross-nation at times. I wonder how the discovery and the admission of evidence takes place. For example, in the in the case in, in the Northern Marianas, that case happened in the Northern Marianas. Uh, and the law applicable was a, a law that uh, in the US, a federal, a federal law against trafficking of, of persons. So that that that, that, that was a case that ha that was a Chinese company, the defendant, but they were working in the Northern Marianas, they were working in the United States. So the, the trial was under the federal rules and there's no like international issue uh, beyond the fact that the company, the defendant was a Chinese company, but everything happened inside the US territory in Northern Marianas. Regarding the, 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 uh, the other issue of the Alien Tort Institute, that's more complicated because that, in, in that case, you're talking about something that happened in Ivory Coast. Uh, and and the, the, the person who bring the lawsuit, they were citizen of Mali. So they were draft people from Mali that were a, a subject, a, they were brought to every cost as child forced labor. Then they moved to the US and here in the US, they brought the lawsuit against the slave. So in that case, a, 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 all the elements of the, the discovery and evidence will be um, produced here in the US because the, the court is in the US is, is, is the court that will finally decide the issue. But perhaps for, for all of those complications, the Supreme Court at the end said, you know, uh, the, the connection is too weak. So uh, the, the lower court is right. The, because the, in, in, the, in that case, the lower court said, it doesn't, it, 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 there's no action, no, no cause of action. And the Court of Appeals said, no, there is cause of action. And the Supreme Court said, no cause of action. It's too complicated for us. And we don't want to uh, make a necessary angry, perhaps. Hermano. Professor, uh, I'd like to know if you could elaborate more the concept of concept of indebted, indebted servitude, because in Brazil I work uh, in, in a lot of operations to find slave to find laborers and to fight slavery, and I've never seen a case of forced labor. Usually they get people from one part of the country and bring to the other part of the country, and it's a very big country, and they, they pay those people so little that they can't come back home, and they charge them like rent, the tools, the food, and everything. So those people, they work, 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 but they can't leave the place of work. But if you, you get there, the employers always say, oh, no, they can't go. Well, they want the door is open. They well, can just go. Yeah. First of all, the, the concept of modern slavery is like a, an umbrella. It's not a legal concept. It's not a legal definition. And under that umbrella, there's a, a lot of this, different situations. For slavery, is one of those. But uh, the indebted servitude, uh, the case that you're talking about that happened with, with, with workers from the northern area of Brazil, right? They're, they're invited to work in the south, in the south. And then you say, hey, you can, you can go, you can leave, but you don't have money. Or in other cases around the world, it happened that sometimes a, a person asks money, so it's a debtor, and the creator says, you owe me that much, so much money that now you have to work for me as a personal servant. So those are, are another topics, another areas within the umbrella or under the umbrella, sorry, of the modern slavery. And it's also a, 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 crime, a crime against humanity. And that's the case of Hacienda Verde, right? In Brazil? Yes. Hacienda Verde is the case. Yeah, Brazil had a condemnation in the Inter-American Human Rights Court uh, because of slavery in a case in Pará. 
but that case has forced labor too. Yeah, and, and another difference between indebted servitude and forced labor is that uh, in forced labor, you will usually see, usually see that the persons who are subjected to this condition, they, are, they came from abroad. So it's also mixed with human trafficking. And in the case of uh, indebted servitude, the most cases are with people with the in the same country. So you don't have the international movement of, of persons. So it's like a, a, a little difference. But at the end, you're uh, also the, uh, talking about persons who are not able to, to move and they lose, they, 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 they are losing their freedom, the freedom to, to move or their will to leave the, the country or the area in the case of Brazil. Please, um, again. Thank you for speaking. Um, during your research, did you find that a lot of modern slavery was uh, like the issues were, I guess, made much worse because of like capitalism generally, like uh, the system that we have, or do you think that there are two separate issues? So what? Capitalism, I guess, like. Capitalism and, and slavery. Do you think that they connect with one another or are they? Two they, they, they connect in, in the way that uh, companies are for profit, companies are part of uh, capitalism. And but the slavery existed long before ca capitalism. So mm -hmm. I, it's not like capitalism created slavery. Slavery has been in, in the society since. If you have, have you had the chance to read history, for example, have you ever, ever heard the, the, read the book, um, The Athenian Republic? five century before Christ. And they were talking about the, the slave in the old Athens. And those slaves look uh, richer than the people of the city. Because in the old times, slaves, they could have things. So uh, slavery has changed a lot during these 2,000 or 3,000 uh, years of history. So when you say capitalism and slavery, of course, there's a relation because companies, the, 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 the bad approach for a company, and it's something that is changing, is that until now, companies it was only for profit. The more profit, the best the company. But nowadays, you will see this 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 concern about the environment, about social, about government uh, governance. You don't want your company to be related with corrupted regimes. So it's, it's something that is changing, but it's, it's a change inside capitalism, it, it, and perhaps it's a it's a new expression of capitalism. It says are, you have money, are you willing to pay a bit more for a jacket? But I would assure you that this, this jacket has nothing in the chain of supply that could be related with a corrupt regime or with a, the human trafficking or forced labor. Or you as a consumer will prefer to pay a bit less, but you will not know if that product, that jacket, it was made by a forced labor, a forced laborer. Sorry. So it, perhaps it's a, it's a change, but inside capitalism. And when you see these 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 law firms and 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 and, and, and Glad that you're here because this, this trend is something that is developing right now. Something that is, that is happening now. It's something that is being built. For example, in Chile, uh, a big, one of the biggest law firms in the country, they just started the ASG department. And um, so the companies with money will try to find some lawyers who would help them to comply with all these, not regulations, but all these uh, ideas of a better world, because they want to be nice, they want the people to buy their shares, they want the people to buy the products. So it's, it, for me, it's like a, a change, but in, inside capitalism, it's like, hey, and, and lawyers will get some money uh, out of this. Charles. I'm just wondering how complicit each state uh, in these developing countries is in the chain, uh, because you have first world countries that are demanding the products, and you have developing countries that are making the products. And just how much complicity complicity is there? I know even in the United States, growing up in a small town, there's farms where the border patrol, patrol agents just never go. They would rather set up their checkpoint on the main highway than go off to a small town road. So how, how complicit is it in the developing country, but even here? Well, it, it is estimated that 4.4 4, 4. 4 billion people lives in countries with a um, defective uh, rule of law, for example. And uh, in those countries, those it's, it's more than the half of the world population. If in a country you can comply with the environmental law, you will also be you will also not be able to comply with labor law, for example. So the rule of law, when it's weak in some countries, those countries are like the best scenario to get this type of modern slavery. And about the complicity with the developed world, 
or I believe that there is some degree of complicity because nothing happened if you if you don't allow it to happen. So perhaps these all measures, these measures, this United Nations measures, etc., the Sustainable Development Goals. We'll see what 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 comes to us in 2025, 20, 2030. I don't know, and 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 the sad part is that I don't think that we could end this like in total totally in the, in the world. I don't think it's, I don't think that is it, it is even possible. So what could we do? What is is in the reach or how or our of our hands to do all the best that we could towards that goal, but I don't think that that goal will be ever be fulfilled. Because how, how can you control that in some farm, even here in the US, in some state, like I know Wyoming with no population, how could you control that? Something happening in a certain area. But what can we do to try to do our best to avoid this thing to keep going on? Paulo. Carlos, uh, we have crimes against humanity in the Rome statute. Uh, of the International Criminal Court. In your research, did you find them in rules like precedent of on the wall courts, international court? No, I haven't I, I haven't searched the International Criminal Court because I address mainly the like like business and, and private corporation. So that's my research. I, I'm not researching what's happening in the International Criminal Court. Okay, it's just because like as you told uh, we know that they like a call from uh, African countries. Yeah, every coast. Yeah, every coast. And maybe the country is letting that happen. You know, just to... <laughs> so they do. <laughs> yeah, so they, they can they, they participate in their own system. Yes, but uh, I. I don't know. I when I uh, talk about the alien tort institute that is for crimes against the law of nations. In that in that scenario, international law to, uh, play a role. Play, play a role uh, because uh, the provision of slavery is part of the US cogens, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it inside the, the business area, the, the private law, the pri private enforcement. Uh, but I, 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 in all that I've searched, I, I haven't read any case in the international uh, criminal court regarding the, the modern slavery. They, they, I believe they more uh, focus on to genocides or things like that. Hey, the pizzas are getting cold, so please. <laughs> they are uh, typical pizza. One is vegetarian, and the other two are with sauce and just or. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. It was very interesting to watch. Thank you. Hey, Brad. Do you want a piece of All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to get you. Yeah, let's go. But I should have Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 that's the companies do all they can for some issue. It's like they will not like demand more. It's not going to be a private party policy. Oh, I was wondering. I was wondering. 
Oh, one million. It's like a room for people. I'm sorry. You have this? There you go. No problem. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you all uh, uh, on internet. Yeah. Thank you for being here. That's why I'm going to put on the I will ask